Do you want to know more about how you can eat for better health and longevity and how your diet and lifestyle can play a part in chronic disease? Then you're in the right place. I'm Claire Day. And I'm Daisy Lund. And we are both plant-based doctors with a passion for improving nutritional education. In this podcast, we will bring you all the latest medical evidence on how a plant-based diet can improve your health whilst being kinder to the planet and fairer to the animals that we share it with. Twice a month, we bring you interviews from experts in the field with a focus on an important topic related to plant-based health, all while sharing recipes and food ideas. So welcome to, in a nutshell, the Plant-Based Health Professionals podcast. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Manil Patel, aka Dr. Iron Junkie. He's a GP registrar. He's also a member of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK. He's got a background in strength and fitness and he's been featured in Men's Health Online magazine. So he's the perfect fit for our protein episode. Welcome to the nutshell, Manil. Thank you for having me, Claire and Daisy. Really happy to be here. I think it was a long time coming actually having a podcast for the plant-based health professionals. So really glad someone's gone and done it. Yeah, thanks for coming along. Well, we've got loads we want to ask you, but first of all, how did you come to be plant-based? So I'll give the short and long version. The short version is um, I went vegan for the animals, but then I always say that I went plant-based for my health. But the long version is a bit more interesting. So I grew up in a Gujarati household, which is like a north part of North India, where primarily people are vegetarian. And the funny thing is in my house, um, all the women who are quite religious were vegetarian but the men tended to eat meat. So being born as a boy, my fate was already kind of sealed. I kind of followed what my parents were eating, but mainly my dad, which was an omnivorous diet, eating quite a lot of meat outside the house. But in the house, we were mainly kind of lacto over vegetarian. But then got to secondary school and I went to an all boys school. So the amount of meat I was eating ramped up. You're surrounded by all these other guys. You're playing rugby, you're playing um, all these sports, you're going to the gym, you know, you need to get protein. So you eat more meat. And yeah, I think when I went to university, that ramped up even more, even though I was in medical school. And for me, a healthy diet was Mediterranean diet. But then I went more towards the paleo side. So I was eating a lot more meat. And in fact, I was the last person on earth you'd imagine to have gone vegan. But then in 2017, I was questioned a lot about my beliefs and kind of what I felt about animals. Because I've always told everyone that I was an animal lover and people knew that about me. But yeah, I I ate a lot of meat. And it wasn't until my friends were going to go greyhound racing and they asked me if I wanted to come. And I said... Well, not really, actually. Um, I'm kind of against it. It doesn't seem like my kind of thing. You know, the dogs are kept in horrible conditions. I objected on ethical grounds. And one of their uh, one of their girlfriends was there at the time, and she said, but don't you eat meat? And I said, yeah, I, I do eat meat. Um, but, you know, this is this is different. And she goes, How is it, how is it different? You're, you're eating animals, and they're treated badly, but then you're not going to go to the greyhound racing because the animals there are treated badly. What's the difference? And I was like, I don't really know. <laughs> And, and I tried to kind of worm my way out of that one, but it really got me thinking. And then um, fast forward a few months and I was actually dating someone who was vegan. She wasn't very pushy about it or anything, but she took me to a animal sanctuary. And that's when I saw all these animals and I was like, wow, these animals have been rescued from, from someone like me, really, taken away from being slaughtered. And, it, you know, if, if it weren't for people like me, they would be slaughtered. So then, I mean, they would be slaughtered for people like me, rather. Um, so that kind of got me thinking again. And then it was July 7th, 2017, I watched a video um, by Gary Yurovsky, a famous vegan activist, and it's called The Greatest Speech You'll Ever Hear. It's on YouTube. I watched that, you know, just overnight, and that's it. I kind of made the decision there and then that I'm, I'm going to go vegan, mainly for the animals. I hadn't even thought about kind of the health aspect of it just then. But then the more I kind of researched, the more I learned about nutrition, I got really interested in what I was. I was always interested in what I was eating anyway. But I got more and more interested, more and more into it. I discovered plant-based health professionals, and then yeah, since then I've haven't looked back. I would say then I went plant-based for my health. Prior to that, I was vegan um, since 2017. Thanks for recounting that and telling us about that. It's interesting how you had various different events, though, sort of around two or three events that you remember from the history of what happened and what got you to the place that you were. Mm. What do you think that very last? speech that you heard what do you think was perhaps a tipping point i think there's always um there's always a series of events that sort of leads up to these things anyway for for most people in their lives you know a series of decisions to make but that final nail in the coffin as it were was during the video i mean when my it was my girlfriend at the time who sent me the video and said watch this video but halfway through the video the guy's going to show some animals being treated really badly i don't want you to watch that because you're going to get emotional and i don't want you to 
I don't want you to kind of base your decision on just pure emotion. I want you to think about it logically. And I said, okay, weird, but fine. But I did watch that bit. And I had this profound kind of emotional reaction to it where I actually cried. Like I actually, tears were streaming down my face. And I was just empathizing with the animals in a way I had never done before. Because I've always avoided watching footage of animals. And you get people out there that will say, oh, I've watched, I've seen animal footage and this and that. But a lot of people won't really watch it and face it. And the ones that do watch it and face it, they almost have to justify it continuing and almost block it out of their mind. And I was faced with it at that point. I wasn't able to block it out. And it was one of those things where once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Absolutely, um, and then, yeah. Yeah, and then from from then on, it was like I exposed myself more to what was going on. I, I, I kind of, I took off the blinders and kind of said to myself, I'm not going to avoid this thing. I'm going to face it and, and, and I'm going to accept how it makes me feel and accept the decision that I will take now um, and kind of align my, my actions with my morals, which I wasn't doing before. That's really excellent, Minel. And it's hard, isn't it, to watch something like that? But sometimes it does take that step, isn't it? Um, Well, let's go straight into protein, because I know that's (laughs) the sort of title of our episode. And that's what we wanted to speak with you about from a plant-based health professional's point of view. Mm -hmm. As a plant-based doctor, can you tell us how a vegan diet can meet the protein requirements for, you know, all stages of life, all activities? Yeah, I mean, yeah, protein, I guess, uh, became a special interest of mine because I was so into health and fitness and, you know, trying to stay in shape. And I was actually quite fearful of going vegan at the time when I did because I was worried about where I was going to get my protein from. And it's the question that all of us get asked when someone finds that we're vegan or plant based. Where do you get your protein? It's almost an obsession with this. And it's almost asked by people that might not even understand what they're saying when they ask that question. So yeah, I mean, it is the position of, as we know, the British Dietetic Association, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, that a vegan diet is suitable for all individuals at all stages of life, including pregnancy and childhood. So I mean, that's the that is the consensus now that a vegan diet, as long as it's well planned, is suitable. Now, you know, protein itself, if we unpack it, it's a, what's called a macronutrient. It's one of the three main macronutrients we get in our diet, which is protein, carbohydrates, and fats, and Protein is especially important for people looking to build muscle because uh, muscle is made of a lot of protein. But beyond that, protein is also important for a lot more things. Um, it's important for bone health, important for kind of the enzyme reactions that go on in the body. All the metabolic pathways that are curated by these enzymes are made of proteins. The structure of a lot of our cells in- incorporate protein in them. The receptors on the surfaces of cells. So there's proteins everywhere. There's like thousands and thousands and thousands of different proteins. And when we when we eat protein in our in our diet, it's actually broken down into these things called the amino acids. So a lot of our listeners probably know this, but just really basically break it down. Uh, you break it down to these amino acids, which are the constituent parts of the protein. Uh, you absorb those amino acids, and then the body then will build the proteins it needs from the amino acids that you that are floating around in the blood. The the body doesn't know whether the protein you've eaten, or the amino acids rather, the amino acids you've eaten have come from an animal or plant source. All it knows is there's an amino acid there. So provided you give your body enough protein to get enough of the amino acids it needs, it will do the rest. And there are 20 amino acids that the body uses. Nine of them are essential. So these nine essential amino acids we have to get from our diet. Our body cannot make them. The other uh, 11 or so amino acids our body can make from the other amino acids. So that we don't need to get them from our diet, but it's helpful that we do. And a lot of the food we contain will contain the other amino acids as well. But these nine essential ones that are more important. So when we talk about a recommended daily intake of protein, really what you know what may become the future is that we talk about a recommended daily intake of these nine essential amino acids because they're the ones that are most important. And as long as we're meeting those, we're going to meet our protein requirement. Now, the RDA or the recommended dietary allowance for protein it has been kind of, they set this target using something called nitrogen balance studies because protein contains in an amine group, the amino acids contain an amine group, hence the name amino acids, and that contains nitrogen. So you measure the amount of nitrogen that goes in, you measure the nitrogen that comes out in your feces, your sweat, your urine, and then you kind of come to a point where you've got a balance of nitrogen and then you can kind of work out, okay, this person is in nitrogen balance, how much protein do they need to ingest to meet this requirement? And these studies kind of came to a conclusion that you need 0.8 grams per kilogram per day for adults to meet this nitrogen balance. Actually, what they did was they came to a number and then they looked at, they took two standard deviations above that number. So they incorporated... 97% 97% of the entire population by doing that. So when you look at standard deviations and you go two above, that should cover 97% of people. So provided people get 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day as adults, 
of protein, they will meet their uh, they will meet their protein requirement and prevent deficiency. So for a seventy kilogram person, that's about fifty six grams of protein, which is not a lot, you know. Yeah. And and a lot of people, the vast majority of people living in the Western world, are meeting almost double this requirement because of the intake of animal products. Uh, just a varied diet we eat. It's very easy to get protein, and protein is so over marketed now everywhere. It's like yeah. everywhere you look, it's like where are you going to get your protein? Here, high protein, this high protein, that. The world has become almost obsessed with it in the Western world. Um, protein is not a problem in the Western world. It's more of an issue in developing nations. And this RDA was set for developing nations to make sure that people aren't getting undernourished there. It's a bare minimum to make sure you're not deficient. That's it. Obviously, we're not here to talk about what's good for the bare minimum. We want optimal health. And it's my opinion and the opinion of lots of what I would call experts in protein research and, and the field, of protein um, metabolism and just few, human physiology, muscle physiology, that actually the RDA is pretty low. Uh, so that 0.8 grams per kilo is fine if you're a sedentary person and uh, you're just trying to prevent deficiency. But for people that are trying to optimize their health, optimize muscle health, are active, optimize your bone health, the, the requirement's probably a bit higher, probably about 1 to 1.2 grams per kilo. And then that number increases further. So when you're talking about athletes, so endurance athletes, you want about 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilogram body weight. And for people that are strength training, so um, bodybuilders, powerlifters, anyone that's trying to build muscle, even your everyday person like myself, I'm not, I'm not really a bodybuilder. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a GP who lifts weights and I've done bodybuilding type exercises and, 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 and done those kind of workouts. So for me, I aim for at least 1.6 grams per kilogram body weight. But actually, sometimes I'll go a bit higher as well. If I'm, if I'm in a calorie deficit, so I'm trying to lose body weight, I'll go to about 2, 2 to 2.2 grams per kilogram body weight, just because protein is uh, muscle sparing as well. So, you know, every day when you're, when you're working out, your body is not only trying to build muscle, but it's also breaking down muscle as well, breaking down protein. So you're in this net protein balance every time, every, every day as, uh, you know, while you're alive, the body is breaking down protein as well as building proteins. So it needs a steady stream of amino acids coming in. So you need to make sure you're eating enough to meet those requirements. So you, you're shooting for a much higher amount of protein than the RDA suggests. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's been easy to do on a vegan diet? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. So if you plan the diet well, it's very easy to do. You, you know, I'll, I've, I've seen some people say actually that they don't even think about protein. They hit their target easily, especially if you're eating a varied diet and you're eating enough calories. That's the problem. When people are not eating enough calories, they might fall short. In meat, it's pretty easy to get it like a chicken breast. It's, it's fairly low-ish calorie and very high in protein. But for plant foods, you have to really know what kind of foods you're going to eat. So things like tofu and tempeh, textured vegetable protein from soya, uh, lentil-based pastas, all these food items are, are very high in the proteins and especially the essential amino acids that you need to meet the requirements. So those are great examples. Are they sort of your standard um, daily type of protein um, intake that you have with, is it tofu and tempeh you mentioned? Yeah. Any so, other examples? Yeah. I mean, so tofu, tempeh, uh, textured vegetable protein, corn is pretty good as well. So I mentioned lent lentil and uh, soybean based pastas. They're very high in protein and very high in fiber as well and tend to be lower in carbohydrate. You know, carbohydrate is not necessarily a bad thing, obviously, but they tend to um, they tend to be higher on the protein, which is compared to eating your usual pastas, it's, it's much better. Also, I do eat, you know, beans, legumes, uh, what else, peas, chickpeas. Um, you've got um, nutritional yeast is really high in protein as well. You don't realize that. It's quite light, but if you eat a good amount, it's got a good serving of protein in it as well. Soy milk, another one. A cup of soy milk will have anywhere between to 8 to 10 grams protein, depending on the type you're using. So I switched out my oat milk and stuff. I never touch almond milk or any of the other nut milks, but soy milk has much higher protein. So I always have that. Yeah. And what about um, seitan? I wasn't aware of what seitan was how before I, I went vegan. How did I forget seitan? Yeah, I don't eat seitan as much because you'd have to, I have to buy it. Okay. And, I, and I just haven't mastered making it myself. I haven't bothered. <laughs> but a lot of people um, will turn to seitan. So seitan is vital wheat gluten. Um, and actually, it's been it's been around for th like thousands of years, actually, because it was developed in Asia, uh, Far East Asia, where Buddhist, Buddhist people that were um, observing a fairly vegetarian diet weren't easy, weren't consuming meat they found a way to create this almost mock meat and they used vital wheat gluten as a way of doing it so they get that isolated dough of the gluten and then knead it knead it knead it put it in water steam it and then it sets in this odd texture which uh, resembles meat so it's been eaten for a couple thousand years at least in asia uh, alongside something like tofu as well which is basically the 
soy milk version of cheese, if you will, like the way they make that. So it's really interesting how these foods have developed and been around for such a long time. And now I've kind of become a staple in like a vegan's pantry. Yeah. So if you're not um, gluten intolerant, it's actually quite a good food group, isn't it? Quite a good way yeah. of getting more protein in the diet. Yeah, really good, actually, because it's, you know, you can get anywhere between 30 to 50 grams of protein per 100 grams. So you're talking about more, more protein than a steak in this, in, in this 100 grams of seitan. And, and it digests really well as well. So when they've done kind of studies looking at the digestibility of something like seitan, uh, soy textured vegetable protein they score quite high in in the actual digestibility so they're really good uh, mm. so provided you're not gluten intolerant of course yeah they're, they're really good to have as well you should give it a go making it i've made it a few times before it's it's not actually that difficult yeah I need- yeah, yeah definitely it's, it's pretty simple um to make but it, yeah it's uh it's really tasty as well and you can sort of then do what you want with it it's sort of like a base really isn't it for most things you can add it to a stir fry or into yeah. a curry or something like that yeah it absorbs the flavor really well as well Brilliant. And just um, on the muscle building, I know you said you're not a bodybuilder, but you clearly have got a fantastic physique and you've worked hard on building muscle. And, and as Claire mentioned, you've been in um, in men's fitness um, online, which is quite an achievement. So mm. tell us a bit about um, your protein requirements if someone is interested in exercise and, and muscle building. Yeah, so I think when you're so anyone that's trying to build muscle, the most important thing to build muscle is the exercise itself. So without resistance training, you're not going to build any muscle in the first place. Your body needs that stimulus. And when you do train in a way that will lead to that stimulus, what happens is it, um, you turn on this thing called muscle protein synthesis. So your body is t- it's almost switched on to build muscle. Now to feed that, you'll need energy and you also need a certain amount of protein, which as long as you get it within the 24 hour period, you're you're going to be fine so the, the people talk about this thing called the anabolic window where when you work out you need to have a protein shake straight away which isn't true um when you work out the anabolic window is almost 24 to 48 hours long so provided you're eating a good amount of protein in it, across the day you will continue to build muscle as long as you keep progressing in the gym um, lifting more weights i think people kind of get really bogged down on the animal protein being better than plant protein because animal protein has higher amounts of something called branch chain amino acids especially the amino acid leucine so i don't know how um into the weeds you want me to get here but out of the nine essential amino acids there's three branch chain amino acids leucine isoleucine and valine and of those three leucine seems to be the 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 king of amino acids which switches on something called um mTOR which is a, a pathway in the body which uh, signals muscle protein synthesis so when you get enough leucine per meal or um usually per meal you'll maximally switch on this muscle protein synthesis so when people are talking about how animal protein is really anabolic and really good for building muscle it's because it contains higher amounts of leucine now that is true if you're only eating one amount of plant food and small amounts of it but if you're eating a good amount of something like tofu if you're eating a good amount of tempeh if you're eating a good amount of seitan these have leucine uh, levels which are comparable to meat same with uh, things like protein shakes so vegan and plant-based protein shakes made of, I think, soy protein isolate or something like pea protein isolate uh, mixed with rice protein. You can get ones made of um, fava bean protein isolate. There's All these things have a good amount of leucine in them. And all the kind of studies have shown that if you get a group of people that are resistance training, as long as you match their total protein intake for the day at 1.6 grams per kilogram, the net effect on muscle building is exactly the same. There was a intervention trial back in, I want to say 2021, and there was another kind of randomized control trial in 2021 and another one in 2023. So all these have been looking at kind of what's the difference if you get vegans versus omnivores, put them through a resistance training program and you measure their muscle before and after. Is there any difference? And they found no no discernible difference between muscle strength, power and even size when they measured it on ultrasound. So and that's, you know, that is three studies. But even if you look around anecdotally, you've got vegan powerlifters that are absolutely crushing it. You've got vegan bodybuilders now. You've got, they're everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of like old thinking where people are really scared about plant proteins being inferior to animal protein. Yeah. Um, the kind of two components that people were scared about was the amino acids, which we know if you're getting enough plant protein, so eating 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, you're going to get all the essential amino acids you need. So that's nothing to worry about. Then people worrying about digestibility because they've looked at animal studies. They've looked at kind of the digestibility in rats and pigs. But, you know, we're not rats and pigs and we cook our food. We soak our food. We we eat blends of different uh, sources. So I don't think that's an issue either. I think people get too bogged down in mechanistic 
studies and don't actually look at the you know the the overall picture and look at what the kind of outcome the human outcome studies are which when you look at them there is no difference between um, omnivores and vegans so there's nothing to worry about i mean i was myself really worried before i started this but the more i've looked into it the less worried i am and even looking at people who are in the uh, field of protein research, they're coming around to the idea now as well that actually when you look at total protein intake for the day being at 1.6 grams per kilogram, the, the difference just completely washes out. There is no difference. So that's, that's really reassuring. Really, yeah, that's really reassuring to know, isn't it? Because, yeah. I mean, Claire, you have some patients who worry about their protein intake if they were to go vegan. Is that right? Yes. I was going to talk about working in a men's prison and it is full of men who want to build muscle. And suffice to say that when I've talked to them about plant sources of protein and the overall benefits of eating plant-based and, you know, I love the Satan steak comparison, they're just not interested and I wanted to ask you why you thought, with so much good evidence out there, why these messages are so hard to get across to people who would potentially benefit from them. I think it's a number of things, isn't it? I think, one, there's there's been this whole kind of, it's been ingrained in us that um, proteins come from meat. And it's just ingrained in us, like in British culture as well. You know, you eat your meat and veg, there's that kind of split and veg is considered literally a side dish, whereas the meat is a main component. It's the king of the show, it's the king of the plate. It's got everything you need in it. And that's and it's hard to unwire that thinking in people, especially when they're not kind of doing the reading for themselves, they're not doing the research for themselves, they're not pouring hours into studying about this stuff. They're going to be completely oblivious to it. And they're only going to know what they've been told, especially by the media, you know, years of being told that meat is for men, eat your steak to get your protein, and you know, showing people a, a well balanced kind of dinner plate. And on that, there's always in the protein section, there's always eggs, uh, chicken, beef. There's never there's very hardly ever legumes. Whereas if you look at the new research now, obviously, if you look at kind of the Eat Lancer, uh, Eat Well Play, if you look at even our NHS Eat Well Play, pr the protein section is starting to incorporate more plant protein. The Eat Lancet one is almost completely plant protein. And the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, even their protein section is pretty much all plant protein. So for us, I guess we're exposed to that more. Whereas people like, you know, these men in the, in the prison, they've not been exposed to that. For them, they only know what they've been told for years and years and years, which is you need meat to be masculine. You need meat to get your protein. It's also tied in, isn't it? That whole meat and masculinity thing. I think that's really hard for people to shake. You know, men want to come across and appear more masculine and meat has always been painted in that way. And it's always been that kind of divide. And as I said, I think the media has done a really good job in terms of, I don't want to say brainwashing, but in a way kind of, yeah, reinforcing that stereotype. And it becomes harder and harder to untangle, you know, not just from an individual's mind, but from society as a whole. But I think what we can do is keep drawing the attention to vegan strength athletes, vegan bodybuilders, mixed martial artists, documentaries like The Game Changers. When that came out, that broke down so many stereotypes. I think that movie did a lot more for the kind of vegan and plant-based movement than people realize, because a lot more men were now talking about protein coming from plants and you being able to be strong powerful fit on a plant-based diet it, it was before that we'd had all you know we had what the health and we had all these health documentaries we had ethical documentaries but no one was really paying attention to what people really cared about the most which was for men especially is building muscle and being really fit and active but for women women as well you know women also want to be fit and active and no one was really talking about these things as much I guess what you could do is screen game changes one day at the, at, the, at the prison and get everyone to watch it and do a and a afterwards and see what happens I would love to. I don't think I'd be allowed to. But um, <laughs> I think one of the more political issues on, on prison food mm -hmm. is going to be about choice. And obviously, if you haven't got access to a range of foods, it's much, you know, having a having a piece of chicken is the easy option. Definitely. And when they're afraid of, of not getting the right amount of protein, I think that's the road that they're going to go down for mm -hmm. now. But nonetheless, their, their attitudes are as they are as well. Yeah, I, I think, I guess it's about changing those attitudes. You are right. I think the way the system is, access is always going to be difficult in some places. And, and, you know, it's very well for me to sit here, you know, kind of, I feel almost privileged that I can have access to all these things, whereas it's just not possible everywhere. But I think we still have to change attitudes where we can. And almost, there should be, you know, there should be change in public places. I think, I think it was Portugal where they, they had it that every public place had to have vegan options available, you know, so... And, and good vegan and healthy vegan options available in every public place including prisons so maybe that's something the uk needs to work harder at yeah i 100 percent agree i think we need to keep talking about it don't we Claire? we need to keep raising it and and raising awareness
Yeah, and actually sort of getting some people who know about these things to go in to prisons and talk to the people that are responsible for catering because often they're not aware of the financial benefits either. They're doing things mm. on a budget and if you try and talk to them, they've got that stereotype that eating a plant-based diet is all about shopping at Planet Organic and spending a lot of money. So they're not as open-minded yeah. as they might otherwise be. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree. Uh, Minil, I'd like to just take you back to um, a comment. You mentioned things like corn and TVP um, mm -hmm. earlier. And I just want to know your take on protein sources that are whole foods versus, say, more processed protein, uh, vegan protein. Yeah. Um, people have often this perception that if it's a whole food, it must be really healthy and so I should eat it, which is great. I think most of our diet should be whole foods and plant-based. But that doesn't mean that all processed foods can be kind of tarred with the same brush. Some processed foods are incredibly healthy. Processing of food just is kind of the label given to something once you've changed the original structure from it or added in other things that you've taken out. So something like soy milk and tofu and even tempeh, I guess, is in a way is processed uh, in some form. Obviously, there's levels of processing as well. I'm not talking about your kind of mock meat mimicking burgers here even those have been shown actually to have some health benefits we can go to that in a second but you mentioned corn and tvp and things i think they're absolutely fine it's part of a kind of well-balanced healthy plant-based diet and actually a really good source of plant-based protein so for people that are trying to meet higher requirements of protein people who are muscle building athletes or even elderly people who you know the requirements are slightly higher for them so that leaning on these sorts of foods if it's easier for them to get that good source of um, plant protein i think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and actually a lot of these processed foods so called so called processed foods are fortified as well so you know you've got calcium set tofu which actually gives you a really good serving of calcium per 100 grams you can get about 300 to 400 milligrams almost your, almost over half your daily intake of calcium can come from just 100 grams of tofu i will name the brand it's cauldron tofu they they calcium set their tofu and i've been using them since i found out that it's calcium set i've never used any other brand soy milk as well i mean people are afraid of um having kind of these processed milks so they'll go for the ones that have minimal ingredients which is just soy and water but then the processed ones have well the more processed ones have things like iodine added calcium added uh sometimes b12 and you want you want to get these things in your diet uh, any which way you can really so I'm yeah. a fan of them and, you know, and soy based yogurts as well. You know, all things, all these things are great, but I think the majority of your diet, as we said, should come from whole plant foods, like your nuts, seeds, vegetables, fruits, your legumes, great whole grains. As yeah. long as that's like 80 to 90%, there's absolutely nothing wrong with um, using these type of foods. Protein powders as well is a, is a, is a great example because it's a, it's a processed food. People are scared of using protein powders and especially, you know, in the plant based community, I think people have kind of uh, away from protein powders because they think of them really pro processed but i think if it helps you meet your daily requirement and you're not leaning on them too much you know making them part of every meal and just throwing protein powder in everything you do which was probably me once upon a time you know i was told that we needed even more protein than we actually do but if you're just using it to meet your daily recommended intake and especially again for people that have poor appetites uh maybe in a calorie deficit for a certain uh, physique goal or competition goal um, you know, athletes, it, it's a really convenient and easy source of protein. And you can get ones that are better quality than others and have less additives in them. But again, when we say, when we say things like chemicals and additives, what we're we talking about, it's, it's, it's very broad and you're kind of tarring everything with the same brush, as I said before, when you're, when I you're talking about these things. I completely agree. Yeah, I think, you know, processed foods has become such a hot topic now, hasn't mm, it? Everyone's mm. talking about processing foods. And I think there's a real range and spectrum, isn't there, from your yeah. ultra processed food where you don't recognize anything that's on the ingredient list. And it's all mm. uh, E numbers to something like tofu, as you say, which is actually really minimally processed mm. and quite a healthy uh, a food group. Um, compared to say I don't know an Oreo cookie which is also vegan but there was um there was a trial actually called the swap meat trial I don't know if you guys heard of that it compared beyond burgers to I think lean beef beef mince burgers and they did kind of people ate one type of burger measured they measured their metabolic markers like cholesterol and all these other things and then they kind of did a washout period and then they ate the other type of burger measured the metabolic markers and they found that the metabolic markers were better in the people uh, after they had the um beyond burgers compared to beef so i think they measured something called tmao uh, yeah. trimethyl i mean oxide and um ldl cholesterol and a few other things as well we're mm. a big fan aren't we at plant-based health professionals of beans mm. and yet we haven't talked about them too much and i've heard you say that you eat beans more as a fiber or a complex carbohydrate source rather than relying on them as a protein source 
And so we were wondering, you know, are carbohydrates not just as important for muscle building and and for maintaining muscle? Yeah, I, I did say that once, I think. Um, but I think, again, my maybe my opinions changed a little bit. So I, I use beans as a kind of, I call it like a top up of protein as well as a healthy uh, source of fiber and complex carbs. So what I mean by that is my main protein sources usually tend to be the tofu, the tempeh, the seitan, but I will always have a serving um, of legumes on the side with that, uh, with my meals because of how healthy they are. So the bean is probably one of the, the healthiest health promoting foods on the planet. Um, every kind of society that's associated with good health and longevity, they eat legumes. Uh, you know, the, I'm sure everyone that's listening to the podcast have heard of the blue zones. And one of the things that uh, is common with all these five zones in the, on the, in the world where people live the longest and healthiest lives is that they all eat legumes, beans. Uh, and that's because, yeah, they're packed with protein, they're packed with uh, healthy plant uh, carbohydrates and fiber and polyphenols as well. I tend not to rely on them as a sole protein source because I have to eat quite a lot of them and they are quite um, satiating. So I get I can get full very quickly and I don't want to just be eating a load of beans because I'll get very full. They're very high in fiber. And I did kind of, when I, when I incorporated eating a lot more beans into my diet right at the start of going uh, vegan, plant-based, I did suffer with a bit of bloating, <laughs> excess flatulence and things, but that's completely normal and to be expected because essentially you're going from a completely one type of diet to now another type of diet so your gut microbiome is just exposed to this whole new array of foods a whole uh, you know so much more fiber as well you know we, we tell people that we should be aiming for at least 30 grams of fiber a day i was probably getting 15 grams at that like if that and i was trying to eat relatively what i would call a healthy diet at the time but i think the average intake in the uk is about 15 grams or less so a cup of beans will have pretty much eight, 10 grams of fiber in it. So if you're eating a lot of beans every day, you're going to really ramp up your fiber intake. So for me, yeah, I see beans as a, as a kind of split between protein and carbohydrate source. I won't lean on them completely for protein, but I do make sure they're in every meal to bump up my protein intake. So they definitely are a good protein source um, as well as a good complex carbohydrate source. And the next question you mentioned was, is aren't carbohydrates very important for uh, muscle be- building and athletes? And they are, they're incredibly important. And I think society has almost made everybody carb phobic. You know, everything should be low carb. You need to watch your carbs. Sugar is the devil, all this stuff. And I, whilst eating a lot of refined sugars every day could predispose you to becoming um you know more obese or uh, if you eat excess calories and then you know becoming more obese and leading to worse type 2 diabetes and things like that the important thing is if you're if you're someone who's fit and active especially an athlete or trying to build muscle you need carbohydrates they're an excellent source of energy when you're doing more intense workouts like sprinting or lifting weights and carbohydrates or, or sugar glucose is your kind of principal source of energy and muscle actually stores sugar in them as a compound called glycogen which is a complex molecule made up of glucose kind of linked together in this chain and when you work out you you and you expend energy your muscles sense that obviously because they need that energy and they call upon this glucose for immediate sources of energy from the muscles and you and every time you eat a meal after that and if you eat carbohydrates you're re- replenishing these lost glycogen stores so glycogen stored in the muscles and the liver but the when you're working out you're using up the ones in the muscle as well so it's important that you're eating enough carbohydrates otherwise you're going to run out of energy and then over time you'll notice that your workouts get worse you might find that you're getting weaker uh, you end up actually losing weight and you know it's it's really important that athletes and anyone that's quite physically active is eating a good amount of carbohydrates per day how many carbohydrates you eat per day will depend on kind of your body weight as well as your activity levels endurance athletes and uh, athletes that are working out two to three hours a day need a lot more carbohydrates than someone who's just going for a walk every day so it, it really depends on what your activity levels are like so people need to kind of work out what the activity levels are and how much carbohydrates they should be eating Brilliant. I just want to pick up on the initial side effects you mentioned with increasing your fiber and your bean intake. I know a lot of us have been through the similar sort of thing. Would you have any tips for people who are transitioning to more plant foods? <laughs> so um, I think doing it slowly is a good idea, not just going from, you know, eating 15 to 20 grams of fiber to like suddenly 70 grams a day. You're going to, it's going to be a nightmare. So doing it slowly, um, introducing high fiber foods meal by meal, week on week rather than going full blown is a good way to do it so you're introducing your body to this new kind of way of eating it's it, the the gut microbiome has a chance to adapt and respond to what you're giving it and the other thing is with beans if, if you're cooking them from raw and the dried bean you want to make sure you soak them really well overnight to help soften them a bit and then cook them really well through until they're quite soft because 
you know, cooking gets rid of things called trypsin inhibitors. It softens the bean up. It uh, breaks down a lot of the uh, hard starches that are in the bean as well. So it's it's really important that they're cooked thoroughly well through. Otherwise, when you eat them, you will suffer from gastrointestinal issues. If you're buying canned beans, a good tip can be washing them thoroughly before eating them. You don't need to necessarily cook them again, but you can also cook them again if you really want. And that suffers them further. Eating fermented foods helps as well find that eating tempeh was really good because it is a fermented so- fermented type of soybean so that was good cooking with ginger and garlic as well apparently can also help um, digestive issues as well eaten quite th- widely in uh, in asian countries especially you know who, who do eat a lot of legumes and beans so i think those are the things i would say um to yeah. really help with with, with, Great tips. with that those are brilliant tips and i think you know generally as you say over time the gut microbiome changes isn't it and actually this, those sort of effects wear off and people can tolerate more we know you're coming to the end of your gp training soon to be a sort of fully qualified gp and and when you reflect on your nutritional knowledge how much of that came from your medical training would you say probably next to none if i'm being completely honest i would say none because when i was in medical school i got interested in nutrition almost because I started lifting weights there and I needed to make sure I was giving my body what it needed to build muscle and recover and things. So I got interested in it just as a side thing there. But in terms of the actual medical training itself, we're taught very little. The only kind of couple lectures it was ever it was ever mentioned was when talking about obesity. We had a lecture on that where it was the kind of take home message was eat more vegetables and eat less food. It wasn't there was nothing really kind of like in depth and in detail about that. Kind of lectures on diabetes those things about eating less sugar and how low carbohydrate diets can sometimes help but that was it and then i guess uh, when we talk about cardiovascular cardiovascular disease and 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 how it was briefly mentioned that eating a diet that's high in saturated fats is not a good idea and also eat less salt to control your blood pressure and eat oily fish twice a week and that was it and that was in the guidelines as well so it was almost like someone had just copied and pasted it off the uh, the nice guidelines in the uk so really poor nutritional training in medical school which is it's a shame isn't it because something like 80 percent of all chronic diseases you could eliminate them by just lifestyle measures alone and one of the biggest lifestyle measures you could take into account is is your diet you know healthy diet is going to help so much at reducing things like cardiovascular disease hypertension type 2 diabetes it's it's just wild that it's just not talked about you know it's almost as if we were worried about putting ourselves out of a job sometimes isn't it well that's the thing i think the UK, I don't know if it's if people think that in the same in the same way, but especially in America, if you look at some things that people say online, it's like, oh, doctors are just trying to keep you sick. They're just trying to sell you drugs, and you know, it's all about big pharma. Um, if they really cared about you, they'd learn about these other things. Which and and, and I can't help but think, are they right? You know, doctors should care about this stuff because if, if we're trying to make our patients as healthy as possible, you should really want to get to the root cause of disease. Which uh, you know, it, as I said, it's the vast majority of it, which are lifestyle. Uh, associated and one of the biggest levers you can pull in your kind of lifestyle arsenal is um diet so i think maybe people don't believe it enough they think that maybe people won't change their way maybe it needs to change and i think slowly it is well that was going to be my next question to you is what Mm. do you think needs to change but it sounds like pretty much everything based on what you've just uh, said yeah i mean there are i know there's some organizations that have been set up now in the last kind of five years Uh, nutritank is one of them group of people that are kind of trying to bring nutritional training into medical school and in also gp training as well we've had some webinars from nutritank but that's something they're doing there's there's the culinary medicine uh, school or culinary medicine kind of group as well which are trying to bring healthy cooking into into universities and teach uh, kind of medical professionals ways to cook healthy foods because i think that's another big thing isn't it i think a lot of people don't have the knowledge or the time to cook healthy meals so then they lean on the processed foods, the takeaways, the things that's easy to obtain. Whereas cooking a healthy meal requires a a bit bit more knowledge, doesn't it? It requires you to actually read about recipe, read about foods, follow the recipe, uh, and actually have the time to cook it and things. So raising awareness and increasing the knowledge of these things is is, is one part of it. Um, And then you can kind of tackle how we give that to the public. Absolutely. And and how is this being received by your peers, do you think? Because I think there's a lot of, um, you know, younger generation of, of health professionals who are worried about things like planetary health and are starting to mm. see the links between climate change and our diets, etc. So how, how is this sort of education received, do you feel? Yeah, um, it's interesting you asked, actually, because I gave, <laughs> I recently gave a talk just on lifestyle medicine to uh, my VTS group. So 
you, you guys know how GP training set up. You have your uh, core group of trainees that are based in the area that you're in. And then we meet up every week to have teaching and stuff. So I gave a talk on lifestyle medicine then. It was really well received by everyone that attended. You know, a lot of them were shocked at the stuff I was telling them, especially about nutrition. You know, I showed them the, um, the Cancer Research UK um, infographic on uh, processed red meat and red meat and, and bowel cancer. And everyone was really shocked. You know, I talked about alcohol and breast cancer and everyone was really shocked. Like they'd never heard of this stuff. So raising an awareness is a, is a good idea. And then I think it is well received by people because I think doc- doctors do want to do right for themselves and for their patients. I think most of us, I hope all of us, but if not all of us, then most of us really do care about this and care about giving the best care we can and, and almost you know saving the NHS as well as saving the planet. These are all things we should all care about. It is well received, but it just needs, we just need more of it. And I think these kind of groups where you're teaching um, normally about traditional medical stuff using those opportunities to actually teach about hey diet and uh, lifestyle can be really good for health hey you know diet can also be good for, um, as part of climate change i think there's a greener greener practice initiative in primary care where we're trying to get gp practices to consider ways they can cut down their emissions and help contribute to the nhs uh, goal of going net zero i think it's by 2050 we're trying to go net zero which I think the it was 2040 before and now it's 2050. So we're trying, but I think, um, you know, people are open to ideas on how they can contribute to that because there's, uh, there's you know, it can be audited. There's, there's probably points associated with it as well in some way or form. There's probably financial incentives as well. So I think people are interested, but just we just need more of it. And we need to keep talking about it and keep making noise. The louder the noise, the more it's going to get heard. So what about you? Do you speak to individuals about their diet? I do, um, when it's, usually when it's relevant, which, funny enough, it, it seems to be quite relevant a lot of the time, especially patients with long-term conditions. I do talk about the uh, diet with them. The unfortunate thing I always hear is that, like, everyone, firstly, everyone always tells me that they're eating quite healthy, and then when I actually break it down and ask them what they're eating, we've come to the conclusion that actually the things they thought were healthy were not as healthy as they thought, uh, especially when it comes to things like cholesterol. You know, I had a lady telling me she loves eating vegetables, but she kind of smothers them in butter, and I was like, have you thought about not smothering it in butter? And Maybe that will help the cholesterol, and she goes, oh, really? And then I explained to her why. So I think where it's relevant, it's really easier for me to have that conversation. I don't necessarily tell them to go fully plant-based, but I always tell them to go more plant-based or plant-forward or because of the health benefits. And I explain to them what the health benefits are. The problem is, you know, as you guys know, we get about 10 minutes with our patients roughly to get through why they're actually there and the problem they come in for, or, you know, and, you know, explain what's going to be happening next there's a lot going on and to then kind of go down this almost rabbit hole of have you considered changing your diet for the, your health and for the planet it's planet is is a different story i think but it's, it's it's really difficult to have that conversation i think what might be a good idea is to have almost group consultations or group kind of meetings with patients and put it out almost advertise it to patients where we can that you know one session a week, we're going to be doing this at the practice. Whoever's interested in can come and, and see and see what the pickup rate is like. It's something that I'm going to talk about with my trainer next year to see if, if, if it's going to be something that we could do. You need to get through to a lot of people and you have a very limited amount of time to do it. Having it in group consultation is probably the best way to really go about it. Yeah, because I think the group idea can be a really good one because it can feel less confrontational because you're not saying or thinking about your gallstones if you lost weight and you lowered your cholesterol and you ate this and not that um your health would be much better but you're just suggesting ideas as part of a group so if people are up for it that's that's a good one yeah exactly and i think you know having patients together with have similar issues and um, similar obstacles that they overcome it, it's quite it's quite good in a way that they can kind of lean on one another and each other's stories if they want to as well and hearing each other's stories can often be quite empowering as well Sometimes we can feel uncomfortable giving advice to others when we don't really know the detail of it and even not bring things up in our professional role at all when when we don't practice it ourselves. So I wanted to ask you, as someone who obviously does use a gym, whether you could give us some advice on how we could flesh out our advice on things like weight-bearing exercise and resistance training to prevent osteoporosis, so particularly when we're having lifestyle consultations basically talking to people about how they can prevent frailty in later life it's, it's difficult isn't it because we're not essentially m- many of us are not trained in uh, physical exercise so a lot of us aren't confident to speak about something we're not trained on which is completely 
completely right in a way we, we shouldn't we shouldn't speak with such confidence when we don't know what we're talking about and i think there are initiatives to try and train people up to become more comfortable at talking about physical activity the name is escaping me right now but there is an initiative that's been set up in the uk for the nhs activity champion or something like that there is something like that that's there but you know if you, if you are trained then it's easier for you to talk about what i tend to tell patients i'm not really trained but i i go to the gym so i guess i have some I have a, a, a bit of a, my foot in the door. So I do talk about talk about it with my patients. And what I do say is, you know, they should be doing uh, weightlifting or resistance training. And they ask me what resistance training is. I'm like, well, it's, you know, carrying a weight or, or, or pushing against a force or pulling a, a weight to put some um, force against your body so that it's the muscles are worked and it also loads the bone. And they go, okay, why is that important? Well, I say, you know, as we get older, uh, um, you know, our bones slowly start to, not break down but they get weaker and that's something called osteoporosis when they get too weak and that puts your increased risk of having a fracture and they go oh i don't want that and i go of course (laughs) so then i say the things you can do to prevent that is you can eat a good amount of calcium in the diet or and and make sure getting enough vitamin d as well because you need to make sure you're getting enough calcium vitamin d to make sure you're building the bone but then what's also equally as important is resistance training which is lifting these weights and they go how how do i go about that i've never done that before and the safest thing really to say is if you if you've never been to a gym um, and you don't like the idea of going to a gym, then it's easier to get things at home, like things that are heavy around the house that you can pick up and lift. Um, you know, you can try and li- lift them in your living room and do kind of practice just picking them up and putting them down, picking them up, putting them down. Do that ten times, repeat that three times over, and you'll feel like your muscles are working. When you get more comfortable at using your muscles, I would suggest that if you're going to just stay at home and do it, to go on YouTube, that's one way of researching and look up home resistance workouts uh, that you can do at home and there's there's so much information on youtube a lot of it is quite good and i think it's up to people almost to do their own research to find out what they can do i do kind of say to them though what i would recommend you do is is actually join a local gym because there are personal trainers there who can take you through the exercises in a safe way and some people are open to the idea, some people are not. It's really difficult to know what's going to really happen unless you're following them up through this. But the safest thing if they're going to join a gym is to actually engage with a personal trainer. Because, you know, when you do join a gym, you get kind of a free, as part of signing up, you normally get a free induction. And during that induction, you can try and ask as much as you can of, of a personal trainer and learn what you can. To continue it in the future, it helps if you've got someone else that knows what they're doing. So either going with a friend, going with a relative, other, other than that, it's going to be if they've got the money, it's going to be ha- actually hiring a personal trainer, which again, it's really difficult. Obviously for us, we're trying to get as much access as we can for these patients, you know, and people. And it's almost like we're creating these barriers. If we say they have to join a gym, or if they have to get a personal trainer, there's almost these barriers. But the, the thing about lockdown, which, it, you know, I think to all of us is that you don't need a gym to get fit and active doing things at home is, is is possible. So, you know, you had Joe Wicks doing his kind of exercises at home and he had like a whole group of people who was following his exercises. So as long as they've got access to the internet and YouTube, that's a great place to start. And if they want to do it at home, they just need to go on YouTube, look at home workouts they can try at home. You know, they can even use their own body weight, try and do press ups on the floor, try and do body weight squats. All these things will load their muscles in a way that will um, help. They need to almost progressively overload that and that becomes more difficult as well doing that at home you'll come to a point where you have, haven't got the the weights and almost then you will need to go to a gym so you know it's easy for people that are able to do that but it's yeah it's going to be quite tricky for, for a lot of people to do it so so at some point you might have to face the personal trainer but obviously the what opinions personal trainers have can vary and I was going to mm. there was one that I was speaking to who actually works for the NHS and I I told him that we were talking to you about um using protein to build up muscle and things and of course he looked at me and said mm, that's so difficult to do on a plant-based diet <laughs> um and I and you know sometimes I think oh gosh what are you telling your patients so yeah 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 it's but that's the thing, isn't it? There's until um, it becomes almost public knowledge that all plants have protein, and you can plan a vegan diet or a plant-based diet to have enough protein. Until that becomes public knowledge, we're, we're always going to face these hurdles and barriers. Just going back to the importance of the, the resistance training, you mentioned kind of osteoporosis. But the other thing that we should also be telling our patients is not just about bones, but about muscles themselves. You know, as people get older, something called sarcopenia happens, where 
the the muscle start to break down um, over time. And the only way to really slow this down, you can't really prevent it, but the way to slow it down is resistance training as well, training that muscle. Because every time you train the muscle, you're almost telling it to stimulate muscle growth. So if you keep doing that, the net benefit for someone who's already having muscle breakdown is slowing that breakdown down. And, and I guess for people that aren't there yet, so people who are in their 30s and 40s, it's really important to build muscle because actually if you have more muscle, then you've got more muscle, I guess, to lose in the future, but also reduces rates of frailty. You know, um, one of the biggest problems that's going to be facing our nation, especially as we've got an aging population, is that a lot more people are going to be frail. A lot more people are, are going to be at a risk of having a fall, breaking a hip, Whilst we can build the bones and, and and try and talk about preventing osteoporosis so they don't fracture the hip when they fall, if we can if we can build the muscles up and prevent them becoming that frail, we can probably stop them from falling in the first place. So I think it's uh it's one of those things where actually if they do resistance training, they can build their muscles up to prevent them falling and they can build their bones up so just in case they do fall, it won't it won't fracture. But I guess yeah, I think that's something that we need to highlight to patients as well, which I, I try to as well, um, tell them that it's really important for their muscle and bone health. That's great advice, Minul. And I think given the fact that um, we're sort of focusing a lot on, on diet on this podcast, have you got any tips for somebody who is starting out on a plant-based diet? Anything that you wish you'd known when you first went plant-based? I always say that my main kind of piece of advice for people starting out a plant-based diet, which is kind of applicable to everything, is to really do your research before starting. I mean, everyone always says this, knowledge is power, right? Um, and if you go into something blind, you're always going to risk uh, failing. Um, so really having a plan before you start is is a really good way to kind of bulletproof it from going wrong almost. And, and that's the thing is, things can go wrong as well. And, and not to kind of be too uh, harsh on yourself if things go wrong. But as long as you create a plan going into it then and do your research, you know kind of what to do, what to troubleshoot. I think when people kind of jump in, then they're more likely to fail and give up. And as I said, yeah, it's important that you, you're not too hard on yourself if things don't go to plan the first time. If you kind of give in and eat something that's not plant based, don't just think, oh, well, I've, I've I've done it now. It's like it's like almost like when you're on a diet and you and you go and have something and you're like, oh, well, we, we might as well just give up now. I think it's important that people don't do that. Just kind of reflect on why you did what you did. Think about what alternatives you could have had instead and plan for that next time. If you're doing it for ethical reasons, obviously, then focus on, you know, why you're doing it. That, that's what really helped me initially at the start, because I was so focused on why I was doing this, uh, going plant based, that it didn't even occur to me to have anything that wasn't plant based. But I've been in situations where if I hadn't kind of planned ahead and brought a meal or looked up where to eat, I, I might have gone stuck and been had, you know, run the risk of starving or had to eat something that's kind of off, off and not plant based. So I think planning ahead is really important. Funny story, actually. So I, I wish that I knew that um, different types of tofu meant different things. Because I once bought silken tofu to try and use in a stir fry. <laughs> so I opened it up, put it out on like a on a cutting board. And I was just like, what is this? It just broke into pieces. I tried to cut it. It didn't really work. I threw it in the pan to try and fry. It didn't fry. And I was like, well, this is rubbish. I'm never having tofu again. And probably should have done it there. Um, but yeah, I won't make that mistake again. Now, we are showcasing members of plant-based health professionals in these podcast episodes. And mm -hmm. so we really wanted to ask, what's next for you personally? So, I'm, yeah, you guys said at the start, I'm a GP registrar. So I've got one more year left of my GP training. Um, and I guess personally, in the next kind of year, I want to kind of develop my skills as a GP because I think I've only really done it for a year. So I'm quite new to it, obviously. I'm considering doing the... Um, the lifestyle medicine qualification as well just to kind of develop my my own personal skills as a lifestyle coach i think being a gp is 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 difficult and trying to get your patients to change is also really difficult and i don't know if gp training alone gives us the the right skills we need to inspire like a meaningful change in people who really don't want to change because it's it's actually just so difficult i don't even blame people it's just really difficult to change what they've been doing for years doing the kind of lifestyle medicine certification might help with that but i'll probably have to do a few locum shifts before i have to pay for that course i guess i want to really continue like doing what i'm doing at the moment educating people on plant-based diets continuing my activism for veganism really excited to actually finish uh, gp training next year and then kind of think what can i do in the future with lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition alongside it sounds brilliant Minol. that's really exciting i'm looking forward to having you back on the podcast already you've obviously got so much to share with us it's been really wonderful speaking with you actually. thank you for having um, me
We can't let you go, though, without asking you what you're going to have for dinner. So <laughs> what does a, a oh. protein-based protein <laughs> vegan eat for his dinner? I was probably going to – it might sound boring, but I was going to have, like, a really big – I have, like, this massive bowl, which I know we're not using video, but it's kind of, like, two palm size big bowl, which I have, like, a, with a salad in it. So lots of mixed leaves, a serving of quinoa, serving of – probably gonna have kidney beans cubed up tofu which i then marinate in a way that makes it taste a bit more like it almost makes it taste like garlic feta cheese it sounds weird but it tastes pretty good and then i make for dressing i actually make my own beetroot hummus so i don't use like salad dressings that you buy from a store i never do but i thought an easy way to just get dressing is to use uh, hummus and if i make my own hummus then i don't have to buy it store bought so i just make my own beetroot hummus at home so i'll be using that as the the dressing i guess so yeah sounds a bit weird but yeah that's no i love that that sounds like a great idea i might use that using hummus as my dressing yeah yeah um so, and then if i want to make it a bit more runny this might be a bit weird you might not want to do this i add um alpro plain soya yogurt to it a couple spoons of that just makes it a bit more runny and makes it like salad dressing like um and it's and again chock full of protein chock full of calcium it's, it's got everything you need and, and, you know, making hummus at home is actually really quick and easy, isn't oh, it? Yeah. I never knew until you make it once. You think, why am I actually buying this? I'm never buying hummus ever again. It's exactly my my uh, my experience. Like, I used to buy hummus stupidly, and then one day I didn't buy it. And I was like, I've got cans of chickpeas for days because we get loads and loads of chickpeas. So I'll just make it myself. So, yeah. But also the fantastic tip on that is you can actually do a hummus type thing with any beans, can't you? You know, yes. you can just any any beans you've got. It doesn't have to be chickpeas. It yeah. could be cannellini beans or butter beans. And you add the tahini and the lemon juice and the garlic and it's still lovely. It's like it's bean, bean pate, basically. 100%. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I was I remember once not having any anything hardly in the cupboard apart from this old tin of mixed beans I thought well do you think I can make a hummus for that and it was perfect there you go. <laughs> it was good so have you got more than a tin of mixed beans in the cupboard tonight Daisy yeah I'm well stocked tonight Claire I'm actually doing um tempeh burgers oh nice. so this is one of our new Ooh. meals that's on rotation because we loved it so much when we first had it it's from Callum Harris's new book um, oh, okay yeah 20 minute vegan yeah it's actually um tempeh that you sort of just cut up finely or chop up or blend with various other spices and binding agents and it's really quick and just pop it in an air fryer or on a, on a stove and mm. um, so I'm having those tonight so I'm looking forward to that. Nice sounds good. How about you Claire? Yeah. So I'm going to be making a bit of effort tonight after last time. I'm, I'm, I've am i actually adopted a, a beef Ottolenghi recipe and veganized it mm. and um, it's with lots of smoked aubergines that you can, if you've got a gas hob then you can just smoke them on there mm. if not you just put them in the oven and um, mush them all, all up add them to some fried onions and garlic and cumin and cinnamon I think that's everything and then you add some fresh tomatoes cook that through and um, instead of beef mince, obviously, I'm going to be using a textured vegetable protein mince. So like one of the one of the soya minces nice. and I'll have that with brown rice. But actually, it has got preserved lemon in it, which is, yeah, it's a really, really nice addition. And some you can put sumac on the top. I think if you haven't got the spices, it's not as delicious as it might be. So you, you do have to check your spice cupboard before you start that one. Claire, your recipes are always so sophisticated and I'm there with my burgers and my chilli. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds way better it's than mine. not true. <laughs> Sounds way better than mine. I'm here adding yoghurt to hummus to make dressing. <laughs> are we going to do our calculation on the protein this week though? Or maybe, the, maybe have you done your iron homework this week, Daisy, because you struggled a bit last time. No, but I'm, I'm tempe. I'm sure I'm getting loads of, loads of proteins. I'm, I'm all good. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Minel. Thanks, Claire. See you next time. Great, see you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.